This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. Did you know the forests across the top of the world are being clear-cut on a massive scale? Will that affect your weather or water supply? For years, environment groups and the logging industry have been meeting trying to preserve at least part of Canada's giant boreal forest. As far as I can tell, not a single acre or hectare has been protected by any law. The Green Group Canopy has had enough. They quit the talks and went back to campaigning. We have the executive director and founder of Canopy on the line. Nicole Rycroft, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here. Before we dive in, for our worldwide audience, please tell us where the boreal forest is and why we should care what happens there. Absolutely. The boreal forest actually is kind of like the green halo around the top of the planet. The area of forest that we've been really focused on is the section of the boreal forest that uh, is across the north of Canada and into Alaska. It's one of of the world's large remaining intact forest regions, basically the boreal forest in Russia, the Canadian boreal forest, and the Amazon are all that remains of the world's really large tracts of intact forest. And in Canada, we're really blessed with this incredible legacy of basically just thousands and thousands, millions of hectares of uh, forests that are, you know, undisturbed by roads or power lines. And Canada's boreal is part of the world's largest terrestrial carbon sink. Uh, It stores the equivalent of 26 years of global fossil fuel emissions in the trees, the soil, the water, the peat. And it's also, for folks who are keen birders, it's the breeding ground for 30% of North America's bird populations. But birds come as far away as uh, Australia and way down in the Southern Hemisphere to use Canada's boreal forest basically as its nursery every year. And then, as you mentioned in your introduction as well, the boreal forest is an incredible source of the world's fresh water, unfrozen fresh water. So this boreal, it's also called the taiga, is that right? It is. Uh, Taiga tends to be used more in Europe than in North America. Talking about an issue that reaches right down to the northern U.S. states, even New England, certainly Scandinavia, right across Russia and Canada, as we're going to talk about. It's fair to say that the climate services of the boreal forest affect the whole world. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, In fact, we often refer to the boreal as our shield against climate change. And that every year with the logging that's continuing the and very uh, sort of extensive logging that's taking place in the boreal, both in Russia, in Scandinavia, as well as in Canada, that every year we're releasing massive amounts of carbon dioxide that have been stored for hundreds and thousands of years in the trees and the soil, in the boreal and the taiga. Well, this is something that puzzles me because I might think, and a lot of my listeners might think, we'll be taking this wood, we're going to, in a way, sequester the carbon in it into lumber or maybe even paper going into landfills or whatever. Then the new growth is going to come up and we'll soak up some carbon. Maybe logging this boreal forest will help the climate. Well, that's not a, I mean, it's not an unreasonable uh, logic train to have. It's just incorrect, Uh, especially with the slow-growing forests that you have at at both ends of the planet. And definitely the boreal is a slow-growing forest. And so unlike the tropical forests that are faster growth, it takes hundreds of years for significant uh, kind of tree growth to take place in these northern climes. And what happens when a tree is actually logged, the machinery needs to roll in, and so there's a disturbance of the soil and the peat that the forests grow on, so that automatically releases a significant amount of carbon into the atmosphere. And then when a tree is actually cut, there's actually a chemical change that takes place. And so even though a tree does continue to store a certain amount of carbon, if it sort of continues its existence as a two-by-four, as a door molding, or as paper that we we read our morning papers on, but it's significantly less than the carbon that it stores when it's alive and standing in its natural system. So there is a significant and massive release of carbon. 
But in the last couple of weeks, Canopy suddenly announced you were withdrawing from talks, from the agreement. Why quit now? Indeed we did. And obviously, as you can imagine, we entered into the agreement with high hopes. We were one of the lead negotiators. I personally was one of the lead negotiators, as was uh, one of my colleagues here at Canopy. So organizationally, we were a key player behind the agreement coming into being. And we entered into it with the intention of it being a game changer. And we heralded it as such back in May of 2010. But, you know, we're three years in. There are zero results. Not a single hectare has been protected. Species are still a risk across Canada's boreal forest. And so, you know, for Canopy, we decided that it's time to do things that are more effective. Industry claims they suspended logging on almost 29 million hectares of boreal forest within their allotted areas, and that included caribou habitat. That sounds pretty good, but is it real? When we started the agreement and the negotiations that led up to the agreement being publicly launched, there were two, not tokens because they were actually significant, but there were two concessions of goodwill on both sides just to kind of show that we were actually really serious in moving forward. So the conservation groups, Canopy, uh, along with two other organizations that worked very actively in the marketplace, we agreed to suspend any do not buy or uh, do not invest campaigns against the companies that were signatories to the agreement. And in return, and partly as a tacit acknowledgement of the importance of large-scale protection of the boreal forest. The forest industry did agree to suspend their operations in almost half of the 72 million hectares that the agreement covers overall. Those areas have, you know, for the most part not been logged in, but the deferrals timed out. There was a time limit of two years on the deferrals, at which point we thought that we were going to actually have because of the way that the agreement has been had been structured, we thought that there was going to be significant protected areas established, that we were going to have a lot of caribou action plans in place, and that at that point it would actually make sense to open up where the deferral, where logging was and wasn't allowed, given that we were going to have a lot of areas, additional areas, and potentially new areas that were permanently being protected and being put into long-term deferrals. And so at that juncture at a two-year mark, it would make sense to kind of step back, have a look, and then sort of redecide on how to extend the scope of that do not log area. Unfortunately, at the two-year mark, we didn't have any hectares protected on the ground and we didn't have any caribou action plans that had been formally enacted by government. And the industry still decided that, you know, the original areas that they said that they wouldn't log in were no longer viable for them to stay out of. And so they just chose another 28 million hectares. I'm sure some of it overlaps, but we're not exactly sure where that is or how ecologically valuable it is at this stage. Nicole, I'm wondering, like big magazines like Newsweek and newspapers like the Christian Science Monitor stop using paper? They went online with Kindle and other electronic readers. That's the big trend. What will Canopy do? And what will the paper industry do if the conventional markets for paper dry up in the electronic age? Well, I can speak on Canopy's behalf. We are definitely have seen in the last five to ten years a dramatic shift to online consumption of information, be it the advent of Kindles to folks just kind of browsing uh, on their laptops the daily newspaper. So uh, in North America, we have seen a significant reduction in some grades of paper consumption, like newsprint. Overall, there's been a slight reduction in the amount of paper that's consumed, although home printers have definitely increased the amount of printing and writing grade paper that's used here. But what we're seeing globally is that there actually hasn't been that much of a reduction in paper consumption. And in fact, overall, the trend is that it's still continuing to increase. And what we're also seeing, and as you noted, uh, there have been some significant titles that have shifted across, like Christian Science Monitor, to electronic formats. But what we're seeing is that as paper mills have closed across Canada and the U.S., that mills are being retrofitted to produce other 
products. So the pressure on our old growth forests, both here in Canada as well as around the world, uh, is not diminishing. In fact, it's increasing, even though paper consumption may be sort of on the drop in some regions. And we can turn, we can chew these forests up and turn them into clothing. Is that right? We can turn them into clothing. We uh, can turn them into what's known as biofuels. Uh, so they're often being either fed straight into a furnace or made into small pellets and sent to Europe and other markets for folks to put into their wood-burning stoves. They are also, you know, any food product that you eat that has cellulose, there's a good chance that that's coming from a forest. Uh, and it's also starting to be used increasingly in electronics. So there seems to be no shortage of places that these fragile and really vibrant ecosystems can actually end up in. It's so strange to think about this. We're talking mainly about the far north where there aren't a lot of people. The landscape can be a little bit forbidding and so can the climate. And yet we're going to draw from that and sort of feed it into the whole social industrial machine. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me that in 2013, we're still using 1,400-year-old trees, or in the case of the boreal, probably three or 400-year-old trees, to print Jackie Collins novels or to put into haagen ice cream. There is something that's really uh, kind of illogical about that, that we haven't been able to work out other options that are more eco ecologically sustainable. And we haven't talked enough about those who live in the boreal. We've just learned from Alan Savory that wild herds have a huge role in capturing carbon back into the soil. How are the caribou herds doing, and what needs to happen to keep them alive and healthy? So woodland caribou are threatened and endangered across their entire range across Canada, um, and that's because of they're a very shy animal. They're very sensitive to any disruption of their range or their habitat. And so any kind of mapping of historical caribou range basically shows that as people and as land clearing has taken place and forest fragmentation has taken place, the caribou have moved further and further north. And so this really is a species, the woodland caribou are a species that are on the brink. They need big open spaces that don't have roads in them and that haven't been fragmented. And that was one of the things that we were hoping that the Boreal Forest Agreement would actually help us deliver, that it would protect 50 to 70 percent of the boreal forest and that it would help ensure the health and proper forest management of uh, for the long-term well-being of species like woodland caribou. But at this stage, it doesn't look as though that agreement is going to actually deliver on that. No doubt the First Nations or Aboriginal people of Canada welcome some logging jobs instead of poverty. Nicole Rycroft, do the First Nations generally support boreal logging? Or do some oppose it? What's happening there? It's almost impossible to give a sort of a generic answer to that. Obviously, different communities uh, have different social needs and aspirations and different visions of how they can help support the social well-being of the people and of their communities. But across the board, what we find with the First Nations communities that we work with is that there's a very strong connection to their traditional territories and to the trap lines that have historically been such an important part and in many cases continue to be a really important part, of not only the cultural heritage of the community, but also the physical sustenance and the economic uh, well-being of the community. And so across the board, I haven't met any First Nations leaders or community members who have been happy about large-scale industrial development and destruction of their lands. Okay, well now, we did see a fairly successful agreement for the Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia. It's still a bit disputed. We'll see how that goes. But you know, Greenpeace has withdrawn from the Boreal Agreement as well, Greenpeace Canada. How will, if it fails, how will that cool the whole idea of negotiating directly with polluters and resource companies instead of the public activism environmentalists are known for? What are your thoughts on that, Nicole? 
Well, I think it is it is an issue of making sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That Canopy has also been involved in the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement, as has Greenpeace. It isn't complete yet, but it is definitely further down the track than the results to date have shown in the boreal. 50% of the Great Bear Rainforest is either under formal protection or a level of conservation. Uh, and hopefully they are tracking towards delivering that last 20% of conservation that all parties have agreed to historically. So when that happens, which will hopefully be by September of this year, that will mean that 70% of the old growth forests of the Great Bear Rainforest are being conserved. And there's obviously been some innovative work and economic diversification work done with local communities and First Nations government are in an equal decision-making sort of relationship with the provincial government. That's definitely a model that uh, Canopy has actively been involved in, thinks that there is a lot of value in and actually tried to sort of seed across into the Boreal Forest Agreement. But, you know, sometimes big ideas don't pan out quite the way that you envision them or that you hope that they will. And so that's when you need to, you know, you do all that you can to try and course correct. And if you can't course correct, then there's no point in lending, continuing to lend your time and your energy as well as your reputational capital to a talk and log process. What's up for Canopy now? And what are your top priorities? So we will be redirecting our energy to ensure that we can deliver conservation results that are proportional to the scale of the environmental problems that we're grappling with globally. So we'll be reinvigorating our collaborative work with the 700 plus customers of the forest industry that we work with, and we'll be looking to develop new strategic alliances with logging companies who are actually really committed to producing meaningful results on the ground. And when we do produce meaningful results on the ground, so large-scale protection and action plans for species health, then we'll make sure that those results are rewarded and recognized in the marketplace. I've heard about an area in Quebec. Is it the Broadback? Can you tell us about that? Sure. The Broadback Valley is one of the boreal gems, and there is broad stakeholder support for an area that's, let's see if I've got the numbers right, 3.2 million acres, which is about 13,000 square kilometers of this beautiful, very carbon-rich boreal forest valley to be protected. So the Cree First Nations have put forward a proposal that would see this massive area, which represents about 62, 65% of that region, actually being formally protected and conserved. And there's obviously Canopy and a number of other environmental organizations are in support of that. We have a number of large customers in the marketplace who are also supportive, and a number of the large tenure holders have agreed to suspend their operations in the area with the hope that the Quebec government will take that final step and formally protect it. So we're hoping for a a positive announcement in that area sometime very soon, actually. Right. I saw a photo of it on your website and immediately fell in love. What is your website and how can people find you on Facebook as well? So our website is canopyplanet.org and you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash canopyplanet. Okay, if anybody missed those links, you can find them in my Radio EcoShock blog at ecoshock.info. We have been speaking with Nicole Rycroft, Executive Director and Founder of Canopy. Nicole, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org.